Enda Varmeni, welcome to another episode of Podcast and Chill. And today is a very special edition of Black Friday. I'm chilling with um, Sylvester Chauke, the PR guru, PR extraordinaire. <laughs> Um, I prefer to be a brand communication guy more than a PR person, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I know the title doesn't matter. I know you're kicking ass, whatever title it is. And, and, and I can tell because you don't love me anymore. Since you've become this huge star, yeah, you got no love for me anymore. I'm like, oh, Sly, my friend, how I miss you. <laughs> love, love never dies. Love, love lives on forever. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So, let's, um, so the reason why I'm having you on, because obviously you've got a big agency that's doing really, really well. And I want to get into that and talk about how COVID-19 has impacted your business. But before that, let's chat about the person behind the business. Uh, how was it like growing up in Snake Park in Soweto? It was actually quite um, um, like any other uh, young person growing up in the township. You grow up with um, a concept of what you think you have access to, um, what is available around you, and you make the most with what you've got. So I knew quite early on that um, I was incredibly unprivileged, you know, um, because of just access to a lot of things that I would have hoped to have access to was a difficulty. Um, and I knew that if I wanted to uh, do anything uh, with my life, I needed to kind of branch out, look out and find other things. And so I spent quite a bit of time out and about in dance classes, dance clubs oh, wow. and things. I can connect with people and hopefully be able to do, um, do things that keep me excited and keep me happy and keep me engaged. Because it's quite challenging, you know, when you grow up um, in an environment where you can only access what is available in the, in the environment. And so you, no matter what, if you want a library, if you don't have a library, there's nothing that you can do about it, you know? So challenging uh, circumstances, but nonetheless, it brought me, um, it taught me to um, have tenacity and to also be um, confident in now, I think in hindsight, in the fact that if you really want to change um, your environment and where you are, you can, doesn't matter where you come from. That's crazy. Have you done anything to change the environment in Snake Park, you know, where you come from? I think that um, there's been obviously quite a, um, an incredible development now in comparison to when I was there. Um, so there has been a massive change and an incredible, um, in fact, inspiring movement um, in terms of where it's at right now. So it's actually a lot different to how it was when I was there. Because when I was there, it was in, in, its, in its very early stages of establishment and, 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 you know, our parents were just trying to make sense in this new place. So it was a lot of um, uh, a lot of work that needed to happen, but obviously, you know, 20 years later, there has been um, you know massive changes, and I'm very connected to it. In, in fact, pretty much where I grew up in Soweto, all over, uh, very much connected to um, to the place that will never it will never leave, and um, very involved in many different aspects, um, and you know, being the sounding board, um, the supporter where possible. Take, take me through your, your, your career path, Nev, from when you started to where you are now. Because, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you once secured a job by delivering your CV in a pizza box. Yes. Um, I, you know, luckily, I, I, I have to say there was a, um, I was very lucky that in, in my very early stages of my uh, teenage life, I, I, I found myself um, exposed to the world of advertising. Um, because I had gone for an audition um, and I was 12 years old and um, at this audition I, I, I obviously did a good job. I was selected to be part of a, of a cast for a TV commercial. So, um, you know, a few days later, in fact the following week I was um, in Newtown um, going to the electric workshop, that old dilapidated building oh, where yeah. we were shooting this, this, you know, this ad. And I got exposed to the advertising industry um, and I got interested in why and I liked the fact that there were people that were doing this as a career um, and I was interested in finding out more and I did and I obviously then got quite interested in advertising and marketing and brand communication. I didn't know back then it was marketing and brand communication but I knew that there was an ad that was done and the ad obviously I saw it on television afterwards and they were selling you know you know um, products and it was 
um, an awakening for me and it almost um, uh, found me. I mean, advertising found me literally. Um, and then I all, obviously, you know, um, went to study further and studied this and, and at, at um, back then Rand Afrikaans University or UJ now, um, where I, 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 I got my top honors in, in um, advertising, brand communication and marketing. Um, and got into the advertising industry, and as they say, the has you know the rest is history. But I'd like to talk about my my earlier, um, even just before finding advertising, um, I, I found joy in in my dance classes, in my uh, in in my youth club because you know after school every day, I had my connections with my girls, and we used to just meet. Yeah, you still dance. post that. I see it on Instagram. You still post some of the pictures from back then. Yeah, big then I, I I had this incredibly exciting after school life, which was um, quite good. I think it allowed me to be creative and allowed me to feel like I belonged somewhere, and that was quite um, exciting. So I, I'm always a proponent for people getting themselves involved in things as young as, as young men and women um, in their communities, um, around them, and in in their neighbourhood. Um, I think it really does something really good for, um, you know, for connection, but for purpose and, and for, um, I suppose, entertainment and staying out of trouble. Yeah, yeah. So after you study, uh, you get your degree and all that stuff, where's the first place you start working? Because I think when I first met you, I was introduced to you, by the way, by Caesar, and I think you're working at Nando's. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, well, after um, at, at, at university, I started working uh, pretty much. I, I worked in the evenings. I worked at a call center for Very Mark, where I used to, um, you know, sell all the all the Very Mark products like the Health Walker and the, <laughs> and the Twister and Bauer Pots um, and all of that. And that was my after, that was my evening sort of uh, gig, my shifts, and then on the weekend I worked at um, at Game Dion or Macro, very Mark also selling the parts and stuff um, across um, the different uh, stores, mainly in the north, um, and that almost got me into the sort of like working mode and um, and and sort of like trying to earn a living, um, and then through through very Mark I then got to work um, as a marketing assistant in the in the marketing department for, for Verimark while I was still at university. Um, and then after that, I knew that obviously I needed to get into advertising. In my second year, we already were starting to do assignments for, you know, for, for part of the course. And, you know, it requires you to, to, to get a job or to get an internship in, in an agency, in the top 10 agencies in, in, the, in the country. So I obviously um, knew that if I wanted to stand out in that um, industry, I needed to do something different so that I could see my creativity. And so um, instead of calling and trying to deliver a CV, um, I went into the office with uh, my CV in a pizza box um, and in the pizza box and, 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 and inside the pizza box obviously was the CV and the top page on it said, um, you need to get a slice of this. And it was oh, my CV. Oh, shit. <laughs> Um, so, so I arrived and I, I, I the receptionist, um, her name was Lush, um, and uh, Lush took my box and called um, one of the creative directors to come down and and um, obviously opened the you know opened the box and was really chuffed by that and in fact asked me to come upstairs to his office and um, and I, I stayed I never left. Wow, man! So you never worked at Nando's. Nando's was, um, so that was my very early career um, working in advertising. So I worked for um, for FCB, um, agency. I went to work at another agency, went to work at another agency called DDB. And then I went to actually look after marketing for Nando's. Um, for four years looking at uh, the advertising and brand communication side of it, which was quite amazing. From Nando's, I went to work at uh, MTV Networks Africa as yes. director of marketing. Yes. And that's, that's when you started working with Caesar's Lomo, eh? That's, that's where I started working fully with Caesar's Lomo, yes. Oh, okay, cool, man. That's dope. So the next question yeah. then becomes, what then inspires you to write the book? Uh, sorry, I haven't read the book yet. 
I'm not much of a reader, but I think I should get into it because just from the pizza story, it sounds like it's one hell of a book. No wonder you were best selling. I, well, I actually think that it, it's actually quite an easy book to read. So if, if if you're not so much into reading, this would be quite a nice read because it's um um you know it's it's told as a story, so it's not heavy, um and it's quite light. So so you might find yourself halfway through the book very quickly, you know. Yeah. So just get in there. Um, the, what inspired the book was um, really the fact that many people, you know, flood my social media asking me questions about how did you get into advertising, mm-hmm. how did you do it, what was the thing, blah, 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 blah. So um, I thought that a book would be incredible and of course my, 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 my publisher, um, you know, uh, felt that there was a story to be told and I wasn't really sold on, on getting a book done about me really, to be honest. I felt like it was a little bit too premature, funny enough. Um, but I had to think a little bit more be, you know, beyond it. And, and then I realized that, wow, it's actually quite interesting how we as young people don't, um, I could still call myself a young person. Uh, <laughs> uh, we as young people don't, don't um, you know, we always, uh, you know, relegate writing of books to um, old and matured and lived all your life and then you write. But the stories that we have, that we hold today as young people is, is it's still very, very valuable and still very valid. So it was a, a beautiful process writing the book. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I'm very happy with the product, yeah. Well, what inspired the title behind the book, Stand Against Bland? It's actually interesting because when I was at Nando, Stand Against Bland was something that I thought um, was what we needed to introduce into the brand because it was something that was, we have to do things very differently. Um, And it was something as simple as, you know, um, at Nando's, for example, it's always wood and never plastic. So you'll never see plastic in the store. Um, Yes, it's always sort of like plate versus, um, you know, cupboard, you know, we wouldn't have that or we wouldn't have, um, you know, sort of like plastic now. So it was quite interesting back in the day. So it would always go the opposite of what people do. And that became like a thing that I, I realized that in everything that, uh, that we do and everything that I did, I just always thought and asked myself whether does this stand against bland or is it, is it what, what is usual, what is obvious? Um, and, and I think maybe doing the obvious is always a little bit uh, basic and it doesn't really change the game uh, or, or move anything forward. And I felt that um, the, 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 the philosophy, I suppose, of Stand Against Bland led me to some incredible work in my career and over time. And that's why I, I actually titled the book that because I felt it's something that I stand for and something that I believe that every young person who wants to do something different must stand for too. Let's talk about uh, DNA now. When do we start developing this baby? Because it sounds like it's been uh, in the pipeline for years now. Well, actually, DNA, um, I left MTV Networks to start DNA, and it was very clear for me then what I wanted it to achieve. Um, But the company had been registered in 2006. So if you think about it, um, you know, a couple of years prior to that, I had had registered the, the business, but I didn't know how it was going to unfold. And part of that was because I wasn't quite confident really that I was an entrepreneur. I knew I was a businessman because I worked for businesses and I was able to work in that system. But I wasn't sure if entrepreneurship was my thing. And I wasn't really that convinced that I was going to become an entrepreneur. So it took a while to really um, almost overcome that fear um, and to think that I am actually to do this and that I have the skill and the necessary knowledge available for me to be able to do it. So it took some time, but by the time that it, it, um, it, it could start, I had already built in, um, um, those, um, let's say reputation in at Nando's as well as at MT in the advertising world that it was uh, maybe um, a, a, a lot, um, I wouldn't say simpler, but it, I, I knew exactly who to speak to. Um, at least um, to be able to establish the business. Interesting time, I must say, um, a lot of doubt, um, a lot of questions in the process. But, um, you know, when you believe in something, you you have to see through. Yeah, you do, man. And, and, and what inspired the name? Because it's DNA Brand Architects. Why did you go with Architect, not Media House, for example? 
Yes, um, that was very, very, um, you know, for me, obvious. Um, the, the DNA part was, uh, it actually had Can you a, just a repeat that because you the were... The DNA as in the DNA. Can you or just... I, um, yeah, you're lagging again there. So, so the DNA, um, you know, part of, of it was a double whammy. It was almost the, you know, the DNA as in the human DNA that you have. And it was actually saying, you know, black um, owned advertising spaces don't exist enough. There isn't enough black owned businesses in media. Um, and I felt that for me, there was in terms of brand communications agency, you know, at the time there was like a handful, not even a handful really. Uh, and I felt that the, um, the opportunity to be able to really infuse this black ownership and black um, um, process into this place was quite important. Um, and then the DNA part of it as well just said that every single brand um, has a has a DNA, you know, so you need to be able to understand the DNA of that brand for it to be the best that it can be when it shows up to the consumer. And so that was something that was, um, you know, you know, was key. The brand aspect is obvious. Then the architect, because when you're an architect, you, you know, you kind of have to literally be quite systematic and methodological in the way that you build your home and you, and you, and you, and you build um, whatever. So you have to make sure that it works. And in order for, 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 for it to stand, whatever that you're building as an architect, it needs to be sound, it needs to be on sound principles, foundation, um, exp expertise, knowledge to be able to, to, to make it work. So I didn't want people that work at DNA to just be, you know, uh, of themselves as architects, as builders of something in the same way that you would build a a building for me. Ash, I think we got we got to call MT man. Your Wi-Fi is disappointing me out here. <laughs> You're not lit with the Wi-Fi, it's like. <laughs> Let's continue. No worries. No stress. Um, so now let's talk through the, some of the challenges of starting your own business because, you know, most people, we see the success. Like right now, if I look at DNM, like, wow, it's a really great company, great brand, doing amazing things. Sly is yeah. so successful. He's making money. But we're not really privy to the trials and tribulations to get there. What were some of the challenges and being a black person as well? Yeah. Now, um, lots of challenges, obviously, as you can imagine. Um, the most obvious one was the fact that um, you are getting into an untransformed industry where as a black player in it, you already walk in at a disadvantage. So, um, you know, what qualifies you to be uh, doing this? Do you have experience? Who backs you? Who, um, who's your mentor? Who, who are you growing from? You know, so all of that was quite challenging. And so businesses and clients in general were very skeptical about giving an opportunity to someone like me. Um, and not only in terms of the opportunity itself, the smallest projects you can imagine, the tiniest budgets you can imagine, and you almost have to be tested um, whether you can deliver. So it's a, it's, it's a heartbreaking fact, but it is a reality that um, you, know, you almost have to take on jobs that are not necessarily um, you know, whether or what you think you do, you, know, you deserve. And coming from the experience I came from, also it was a huge change in terms of the kind of budgets I worked on, projects I did, and all of a sudden I'm working on the smallest and tiniest budgets from some of the brands that I actually don't even believe that, um, you know, um, you know, they, they, you know, they should be, I suppose, investing in that way. And then, um, interestingly, the other challenge was um, at Nando's, they knew me as the guy from Nando's and then MTV, I was the MTV guy. When I then started DNA, in every meeting I would go to, they would say, but who are you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, and I have to say, but I used to, I am Nando, ex Nando's and uh, and And it's funny, it's funny. I remember actually, feeling so heartbroken at going to a really big meeting and they I had asked, you know, as part of the introduction, they just said, so why, why should they listen to me and my business? Because what have we done as a business? Mm -hmm. And it was quite, it was quite challenging because yes, as a business at the time, we actually hadn't done anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I was just riding on my previous jobs to try to give me credibility 
um, but and I felt so heartbroken. It was almost like I was so used to being um, in a working in an environment that I had a title, and all of a sudden I didn't have any, and I didn't have any street cred actually um, as the as the new business. So getting opportunities it becomes quite challenging, and that's why you have to lobby and really um, spend time building um, uh, friendships, networks. Um, you know, doing work for free for people so they can start giving you opportunities that you can show um, that you are, as a new business, you've got the goods and you are, you are able to deliver. So I found that incredibly, um, you know, interesting and challenging. Um, and then the other part was, you know, when you start a business and then you, you, you start a business alone, you know, it's a little bit odd too because it's like a one-man band um, and it just, it's lonely. It's incredibly lonely. And all your friends work for companies and you know, it's just incredibly challenging. And in fact, some of my friends were even making fun of me because they felt that um, the minute I started becoming an entrepreneur, I kind of fell on the LSM ladder quite, <laughs> quite, quite terribly. And in fact, one of my friends said, oh my God, Sylvester, I would have imagined by now you would be at a, at a higher LSM. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> because you know, you start an entrepreneur, such as an entrepreneur, you literally have to be lean and you have to be as smart as you can with your money. So you cannot be lavish and overspend and have fancy cars, fancy houses and things. Yeah, you gotta you sacrifice to, a lot. In, you know, sort of be you have to sacrifice it's, it's just building something worthwhile right so working alone was lonely and and challenging and then also um getting to build a business also from scratch is is definitely that on its own um you know a routine what is your routine um do you wake up in the morning what time where do you go where do you start you know it just you almost have to be as a loner and um, you know, that routine you used to have at a company, you know, you know, falls away. So it's, it's, it's incredibly tough. All right, so let's fast track 2020. COVID-19 is here. How has it impacted your industry as a whole? Hmm. It's actually interesting because um, I have been in conversations with a lot of the leaders in this space, um, especially black owned companies. And um, there are two things happening right now. The one is that some agencies are doing incredibly well over this period because most clients have seen the need to communicate, to communicate differently and to really land and to be differentiated. So we're seeing on the one hand, very good uptake on revenue increases and projects. Oh, wow. um, yes, on the other hand, there are some um, that are affected by projects that had been um, on the pipeline or that were scheduled to be active now, which have now been moved out to later in the year or to then the next. Um, but on the whole, you can understand that our clients who are the ones that pay us, they also have had a couple of weeks of no income in a fast food you know, category in travel. I have a client in travel who have literally been wiped out, you know, um, over this period. And um, so we, so we, to um, some of the challenges that we are experiencing is, is those revenue losses that we now have to almost manage. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, at the moment, it's all like leading, but you are leading, um, you know, through the fog mm. because, you know, you, you know, things are moving and changing so, so rapidly, but you, you almost need to still um, figure out exactly how to do so. No one really has all the answers. So every day, is different and we have to um, I check my numbers every day I check my project on a daily basis just to see if there's any movement or change so it's it's a it's a it's, it's a challenging time obviously for customers um, and and I think we are going to be seeing an incredibly difficult time in the next couple of months so from one businessman um, to another businessman what advice would you give to people that are out there that are watching this who have businesses that are at a, at a standstill yes um, I have to say that it is, it is, um, it's, it's a difficult time, um, you know, um, granted, but as leaders of our own organizations, it is an opportunity for us to lead 
because we can't um, now be taken aback by it. Um, and so we need to stand forward and, and step into the role and lead our people and lead our businesses, number one. Number two, I think um, what's critical is your own, um, I, su I suppose, your, your strength as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. Because we forget the fact that we are human beings, we feel like everyone, we get anxiety like everyone, we get challenged like everyone. And right now, I'd say, if you, are, if you believe in the, in the higher power, whichever power you believe in, tap into it, um, get yourself ready in the morning, um, you know, read in, 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 in inspirational, important, influential, um, or exciting um, aff affirmations about, you know, about, um, you know, what you do. I guess what I'm saying is, watch your spiritual well-being as a leader at this time because you need it um it's not easy and so from an emotional and personal side it's something that you do need to engage in so my advisors i've been on calls with my friends very often good friends obviously um calls with family calls with other entrepreneurs i've had on a daily basis i'm speaking to other entrepreneurs how are you doing look um, look at how i manage this you can use it share it amongst each other and so it's been really great in that in the sharing um you know aspect so look after your spiritual and your and your personal side then i think the truth is that you got to look at the facts of your business and for me one day before closing um or before lockdown was was instituted i spent i spent time at the office and i actually had my little plan of what i need to do in the next couple of weeks while we're on lockdown so the one is the team so what is the plan for the people, for the team? So how are the team operating? What is the system? How do we check in? How often do we check in? Who do we check in with? How do we ensure that there's a system that works while we are away? Because while we don't, we're not making money, but we also need to be able to do something while we are on lockdown. We can't just sit and watch TV. We can't just sit and watch, um, you know, and watch uh, movies. You know, we do need to, um, do work that's related to our business and look at our business differently. People, important point, uh, number one. Number two, for me, was, was uh, the big thing was that, that gave me anxiety the most was um, finance. So it was money. Um, so how much money do we have in the system? How much money is owed to us? How do we try to recover that money? And also with the money that we have in the system, how long is that going to last us? Are we going to be in business for two months, for three months, for six months? Or... So you need to understand um, your um, liquidity and what, um, um, you know, what, how long will you survive with what you have got? And be honest about it. It's, it's actually critical that you are honest about it. Then the third part for me was the clients. Um, our clients are going through things right now. Don't disappear while they're going through these difficult times. You need to be in there. What do they want? How can you help them? What do they need? Can you write something? Can you send something? Can you do something? So I think even just the check-in, a regular check-in with your clients, just to make sure that there's been, um, you know, there's continuity of the relationship, even though you might not be activating every single thing right now, because I think it's going to come in handy when we are able to lift the, the, you know, the lockdown. They will remember people that were with them in the trenches um, when things were, were very difficult. Speaking about um, clients, do, do you guys um, have like agency beefs? Because you're all competing for the same clients. Um, I think, you know, you, you compete for the, agent, you know, for, for the same client at, at pitch phase. So, yes, at the beginning, there, there'll be four agencies and, and, and you pitch and the best agency wins. It's generally us. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, uh, <laughs> and then, and then, so, so once, 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 um, you then win and then you are appointed as the agency. So you then have a, um, a contract with the agency for three years or two years or a year or six months. Um, and then, you know, the competition is over for that period. You know, you now, you, you now, you, you know, you now focus on delivering, but the industry itself, it's a highly competitive industry. So you are as good as your last gig, uh, you're as good as your last job, and things can change very quickly. So we, 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 we are used to, and I must say, maybe that's why in our industry, we, we, we're just rolling with the punches now, because we're so used to mm. you know, struggling a lot and pushing and fighting and pitching. And so it's never been like where we're just so comfortable and making mm. money. Um, 
you know, we are always hustling. So that helps us. So right now we're just doing what we normally do, just a little bit more heightened. Um, and, and, and that's really quite, you know, you know, quite key. So just to recap for me, people, your people, at, uh, people that you work with that, you know, that you lead, how's the system, how's that, uh, you know, coming along. Of course, before that, I said, I spoke about the individual, the leader, uh, what are you doing to uh, upskill yourself, to learn new things. And I, I'm learning so many things about how businesses in China survived, how mm. agencies in in Russia have been able to come back to work or, or in the UK or areas that have been affected. So uh, always on calls and Zoom calls and listening and, and, and learning things has been phenomenal, you know, for me. So be in, be involved. Of course, um, our clients keep tabs with our clients and money. Uh, how much do you have? How long will it last you? And have an honest idea about how that's going to look like. And you know what's also interesting, um, Mac G, is that... Um, it's also an opportunity to strengthen your business. I've seen that in, 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 in my business, um, there are things that needed to be strengthened. Definitely. Hmm. Um, areas of waste, lots of areas I've realized of we waste, we waste money in other, in other areas that are not necessary. How much we're spending on, on a lot of things around your, 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 your line items of your business. So this time has been so good in that as well. Because I know that when we open, um, I know that certain things that need to go away, that needs to change. We need to be more efficient. Um, teams, you know, you, you are able to see over the period, who are the people that are, who are your soldiers? Who are the people that are driving your business mm. in a time like this? And they help to show you your true business. And when your true business comes through, you know, it's either going to be, wow, I'm impressed or my goodness is not bad and I can fix these areas or, or my goodness, I need a completely different, um, you know, system or, or um, a business model um, or adjustment. So things, for an example, how much you spend on rent mm. um, hmm. and, and how much is that rent uh, design quota like, isn't cheap, eh? Design quota isn't design cheap. Design isn't cheap. The space, that, you know, that you're using it. Your line items, how much you're spending on IT infrastructure, on 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 drinks and things. So this, this time has helped me as a leader and my team to see that wow, we can improve things because we 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 thought we needed those things, but we actually don't need them, um, or we need to adjust them differently. So that's been very good. Wow, man, I like that. And just in closing, what do you? I also think that I, you know, I, I, I also think that in terms of some of the challenges that many many young entrepreneurs are facing right now, um, is I need to keep as much cash as possible in in the business. So you're not really at this time spending money and doing many things. So you want to, you know, um, um, you know, conserve um, as much cash as possible in your bank account. So conversations with your landlord where, where possible. Have been good because I, I you know for me to have a call and speak to the landlord and say hey uh, what is a you know provision what is available what can you do for me not to say that you don't necessarily have the money to pay but right now you actually want to keep the money you don't want to be spending it in that way so um, as much of those kind of areas where you can be able to negotiate uh, periods for you you know you know to manage your unit you know, your cash because we know in our small businesses that cash is 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 a is the lifeblood of those businesses, and without it, our businesses suffer very quickly, and we can be out of business um, without intending to be. Yeah, wow, I like that, man. And um, in closing, uh, what do you want to be remembered as? You know, as uh, Sylvester, the the the, the person. Hmm. It's a beautiful question and, and a difficult question. <laughs> um, when I started DNA, I started DNA um, with the intention to um, work on contributing to the brand communication industry as a black professional, um, to be the company that um, grows and, and, and infuses black, brilliant talent into this industry and into the world of brand communication so that the business of um, advertising and brand communication of us as black people and that we are 
uh, shaping it and are changing it. Um, you know, in, in, in the 26 years of democracy, um, the industry has regressed um, and the, the numbers of black professionals and talent have literally migrated out of this industry into um, business, you know, into the corporate industry. So we are losing good talent uh, because the industry is incredibly unforgiving to a black professional mm. and to a black um, owned company. And I think my contribution in the next um, couple of years is to um, be a, you know, to, to be a business that can show many other black businesses in this space that it can be done, it's possible, and that we can make a difference and that many, many more black owned agencies need to form and many more black agencies need to come to the fore and take center stage in the world of, of, of brand communication as we see it. No one is gonna give it to us. No one is gonna invite us to come to the table to sit and be part of it. We need to be able to create our own table. We need to be able to create our own, our own businesses that can employ our people. And we need to be the ones that are at the forefront of creating work that is lauded by everyone so that they can see that being a black owned business is not a liability, but in fact, it is an incredible um, opportunity for many brands and many businesses in South Africa. So I want to be part of that. I want to continue what some of our ed advertising industry greats, like Peter Hundla, Gwen Gomo, Hepin Tingela, Nunu Tingela, incredible men and women who led um, great businesses as black professionals. And I think we need to continue to make our mark and continue to have our voice uh, heard in the space. Yeah, and make sure you tell your clients and your brands the podcast is open for business. Podcast is open for business. Listen to the podcast right Oh shit, I can't hear you. Fuck. I can't hear you. I can't hear. I didn't hear that. I missed all of that. Oh no, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, you're saying? I'm saying the podcast. Um, how many um, listeners are you know are on it on average? We, we we've got thirty five thousand strong now. We're the biggest in the country. That's very good, hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's very good. Okay, so hit me up and maybe we, we, you know we we might um, convince a few sponsors to come on board. Yeah, no, that'd be great, man. Uh, Sly, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I mean, from the moment I met you um, till now, I don't know when I met you, like 10 years ago, you're still the same guy. I love your energy and long may you continue. And I hope whoever's watching this who aspires to be like you uh, got what they wanted out of the interview, you know, because you certainly inspire me. It's nice to see other black people, young people uh, excelling and doing really well in their field, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, definitely. And I have to say, you know, McG, what you're doing is, is important because um, it's not just about entertainment, um, it's about our voice as black professionals, as black hustlers, trying to make a, an interesting future for us. Because, you know, we grew up um, in this space um, and we were yanked into this environment and we are learning it for the first time ourselves. We are, we are charting the path ourselves, we are figuring it out. And what you're doing with this podcast is about educating our people um, with, info, you know, arming them with information and knowledge that can help spark an idea. And if it's one, if it's one person that is, is engaged and, and, and sparks a concept and idea from this, we would have won. And may you continue to grow from strength to strength. Um, and I, I wish you all the best with, 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 with this podcast. Like I said, G, you are important and this is incredibly important. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Apart from uh, your company, what else are you busy with? Are you writing another book? Are you going to be on TV again? No, I'm actually, um, no, I'm actually not really not writing um, a book yet. I write every day, but I write other things. Um, for now, you know, it's it's um, a lot of focus on the business, um, and I've got quite a lot of other projects, you know, that I, I have J and J as usual. Um, but you know, I think post COVID, our our direction, you know. You know, it's all hands on the steering wheel to ensure that what we've done so far, you know, stays on, focuses on, and it grows. Yeah. Fantastic. Hopefully, better. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you and so much. I'm sorry about the internet, um, but yeah. Uh, don't worry. What do they say? Ndiagranza. 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 I'm a man of Randa. I can't remember what you.
Thank you so much, Lai. All right. Cheers, bye. Bye-bye.